We're looking at a message called Two Wisdoms. Two Wisdoms. You're going to notice that the title indicates that there are two wisdoms. Now, we're going to come to realize within our study rather quickly that these two supposed wisdoms, that one of them is an imposter. It's kind of a pseudo wisdom of the world that we find to really be no wisdom at all. We find the, the concept of wisdom throughout the scriptures. It was by his wisdom that God created all things. It was the spirit of wisdom that God gave uh, to those who crafted the tabernacle. He gave wisdom to Moses and Joshua to lead the people of God. And it was wisdom that Solomon asked for, not riches. And then later on, it would be wisdom that Solomon would write about in Proverbs. It was wisdom that God gave to Daniel and his friends in Babylon. And it was wisdom that Jesus increased in as he grew from a young boy. Wisdom was in the list of requirements to find seven men to help in Acts chapter six. And it is the very wisdom of God that he has chosen to confound the so-called wisdom of this world. But what is it? Well, it's been said before that wisdom includes the ability to use the best means at the best time to accomplish the best ends. And I like that. I think that gives some context to what we're talking about, wisdom. Wisdom has been referred to as the fitting application and proper use of knowledge. Knowledge understands the light has turned red. Wisdom applies the brakes. Knowledge sees the quicksand and wisdom walks around it. Knowledge memorizes the Ten Commandments. Wisdom obeys them. Knowledge learns of God and wisdom loves him. C.H. Spurgeon said this, wisdom is the right of knowledge. To know is not to be wise. Many men know a great deal and are all the greater fools for it. There is no fool so great as a knowing fool. But to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. Wisdom. And isn't it true in our world today that it seems like some of the most knowledgeable, the most learned, become the biggest fools and say the the most ridiculous things when the wisdom of God is not adhered to. 2 Timothy 3, 7 says, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You see, you can have knowledge without wisdom, but you cannot have wisdom without knowledge. And within our text today, wisdom is referred to four distinct times. You want to You might want to just note that down. Four distinct times is wisdom mentioned in these handful of verses. We will find that the author, which is of course James, that he's going to pose this grand question of who is truly wise. And then he's going to go on to describe two wisdoms, the wisdom from below and the wisdom from above. Now the book of James, if you're not familiar, is like a fire hose. I mean, seriously, it is one of the most jam-packed New Testament letters, and it's only five chapters, but they're truly epic. James is the kind of guy that you want to meet in person because he just seems like a stud. I've found that these chapters, James just says it how it is in the most like punch you in the face loving kind of way, where you walk away and you're like, that hurt, and that was awesome. And that's what you'll find in the book of James. Uh, you'll find that they are the most, some of the most practical chapters in the New Testament. And it's because the whole book, the entire theme, revolves around actually doing Christianity and not just playing church. In the previous chapter, chapter 2, James makes some bold statements that I would think most of us are familiar with. He lays it out that faith without works is dead because faith always works. And then in chapter three, James goes for the jugular by getting into the topic of the untamable tongue. He talks about the unruliness and the power of one of the smallest parts of our body. And right before where we pick it up today, James addresses the conundrum of how it is that out of the same mouth can flow and proceed blessing and cursing. 
And it's at this challenge that James will ask a very important question as he transitions into the topic of wisdom. And so let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word today. We do this out of honor and respect because we believe what we're about to read really is the word of God. This is his word to us this afternoon. And so I will go ahead and read this. You follow along in your own Bibles, in your own head and heart. Uh, you can look to the screen as well if you, don't, if you do not have a Bible. Um, but I will read starting in verse 13. And I'll basically read to the end of the chapter, verse 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And finally, verse 18. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray together. Father God, this is your word. And we ask that through this passage today that you would teach us, that you would instruct us, that you'd equip us and, God, you would do what you want in us, that you'd have your way. And so, Father, we pray that you would bless this message today, and we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. Well, as I mentioned, James opens up with a question that he poses. And this question is directed toward those who not only possess wisdom, uh, but also understanding. Because according to James, those two things go hand in hand, wisdom and understanding. Now this word wise that's used here in verse 13, it's the Greek word sophos. It's basically the typical Greek word that you find for wisdom in the New Testament. It describes one who possesses uh, discretion and discernment of what to do and how to do it and when to do it, uh, like we talked about in our introduction. But then there's this word understanding. This word means skillful or intelligent, learned. This word has the idea of someone who is capable, experienced, one having the knowledge of an expert. And it's clear that this question that he poses is a rhetorical one. James isn't looking for an answer because he answers it right away. James is seeking to bring his audience to the realization that wisdom and understanding is not simply something to be claimed, but something to be displayed in one's life by good works and meekness. Wisdom will show not by just what you say, but by what you do and how you live. Saying you have wisdom doesn't give you wisdom. Hosea in the book of Hosea, poses a similar question. And I wonder if James kind of got some inspiration here because it's very similar. Hosea 14, nine says, who is wise? Let him understand these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. You see, it's not only to know, but then to walk in the right ways of the Lord that is wisdom. Now, in response to his own question here, I want to put your attention back to verse 13, and I want you to see verse 13 as kind of a teaser. It's kind of a little sample where he transitions with the question and begins to talk about the topic of wisdom. Starting in verse 14, he's going to then get into the two types of wisdom, and that's going to be the bulk of our message. But before he does, he wants to set the stage and set the tone. And he answers his own question, giving the action and the attitude of true wisdom. If you're taking notes, note down the action of wisdom. The action of wisdom is the fact that it says, let him show by good conduct that his works are done. Now that phrase, let him show, it's very familiar in the book of James. Because in the previous chapter, he uses this, a similar phrase 
that means to show by proving, to demonstrate. Here's a verse you might be familiar with, James 2.18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You see, like faith, this is also true of wisdom. To say you have wisdom is empty. But to show in your life by your good conduct, now this is wisdom. Which goes right in line, think about it with what Jesus said, you will know them by their fruit. The Bible Knowledge Commentary puts it like this, wisdom is not measured by degrees, but by deeds. It's not a matter of acquiring truth in lectures, but applying truth to life. See, the one who is wise isn't the one who attends all the Bible studies, it's the one who goes and puts it into action. But along with this, action is an attitude. An attitude, and it's an attitude that's not often associated with wisdom, especially in this world. Meekness is the farthest thing from a typical attitude of wisdom that we might think. This is the attitude that always accompanies the action. You can always know wisdom if there's a mark of meekness. This word meekness, it means gentleness or humility. It's to be even tempered. Now this is not weakness. It isn't timidness or shyness. It isn't niceness. It's not even a personality thing where some people have it and some people don't. No, I believe meekness is a supernatural attribute that is given alongside the life that displays wisdom. It's been said before that meekness is the right use of power while wisdom is the right use of knowledge. Meekness is eighth on the list in Galatians 5 regarding the fruit of the Spirit. We know it as gentleness. It's the same Greek word. The one who is wise doesn't see himself in superiority. It's actually one of the, the ways you can tell someone has no wisdom is if they say they have wisdom, that's a pretty good indication. This true wisdom does not only show itself in action, but with an attitude of humility. Note down Romans 12, 16. Romans 12 says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Proverbs talks about don't be wise in your own eyes. But remember, this meekness does not mean weakness. It means power under control. And the, the one who displayed this perfectly was Jesus Christ. You want to know what meekness, the meekness of wisdom looks like? Look at the life of Jesus. There was something about Jesus. He was one who had all power, all control, yet it was the little children who would want to come and talk with him. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, he describes himself. This is what Jesus says of himself. He says, take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. He's meek, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, Jesus had all power, yet he chose to empty himself and make himself of no reputation. Rather than coming to be served, he came to serve. Serve. It would be how a trained Navy SEAL who would have the power and know-how to take anyone out, would be able to come home from the battlefield and take his newborn baby in his hands and treat that baby with tenderness and care. Meekness is power under control. Now, someone may know a lot and may display all kinds of impressive qualities, but we must realize that meekness is the mainstay of true wisdom. And the twofold evidence here of wisdom as he gives this little teaser, this little Costco sample, he says it will show itself in good works and it will manifest itself in weakness. And before he dives too much into what true wisdom is, he first wants to talk about the opposite, the wisdom from below. 
For the remaining time today, we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 18. But first, verses 14 through 16, they describe the wisdom from below. Then in verses 17 and 18, James describes the wisdom from above. And we're going to use a similar tactic as we approach these two wisdoms. And in each of them, we're going to look at three things that James gives in detail. We're going to look at the origin. We're going to look at the characteristics, so where it comes from, what it's like, the characteristics, and then also the result or the outcome. What, what does this type of wisdom produce? So those three things, we're going to look at both. Uh, under those uh, three points for each wisdom, there might be a couple sub points, so get your pens ready. We're first going to look at the origin of this wisdom from below. Note it down in verse 15, we get the origin. The origin of this wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. James describes it as the wisdom that does not descend from above, which indicates to us that it ascends from below. It doesn't come down from heaven, but it rises from hell. It is a man-made wisdom originating from the evil one, it is a false wisdom, which, as I said, is really no wisdom at all. That's why you could put parentheses around this wisdom. It is actually the antithesis of true, heavenly, God-given wisdom. It is a counterfeit. Now, you'll notice here in verse 15, a threefold description of this origin of this so-called wisdom. Look down the first one. He, he calls it earthly that it's earthly wisdom. This means simply of the earth. It's in sharp distinction of being from heaven. Often with a negative connotation, this word is used in the New Testament. Another translation could put worldly, to be earthbound. Uh, Adam Clark, he, he said this was having this life only in view. This false wisdom acts with no thought of eternity, no thought of heaven, and no thought of life after death. This is exactly like what John Bunyan wrote about in Pilgrim's Progress. You remember the character that came alongside Christian and deterred him away from the path that evangelists put him on? It was described as Mr. Worldly Wise Man, who came and tried to deter him and to go another path, that burden, Christian, that you have on your back, let's, let's try a different way. Don't go that. There's an easier way to go. It's sensual. Secondly, sensual, unspiritual. That's what sensual means. It actually means natural, pertaining to human nature, which has been inherently sinful since the fall. And no, this is not a good thing. You might like to see all natural on your groceries, but you don't want it on your wisdom, okay? <laughs> this wisdom is completely separate from spiritual. That's why that term sensual or natural, unspiritual, this wisdom not only refuses to believe in anything but what is natural, which would be the spiritual, but, but can't even comprehend the spiritual if he wanted to. 1 Corinthians 2.14 describes for us that truth, but the natural man, the sensual man, does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. This wisdom has no thought of spiritual things. Thirdly, it's demonic. It's of the devil. And to no surprise, this wisdom has de the devil's fingerprints all over it. He would be its very designer. But even in this design, it would be a cheap ripoff from the wisdom that is God's. You see, if you know anything about Satan, you know he is a copycat. There is nothing original about him. He always takes what God creates and perverts it with the promise of greater freedom, only to take those into greater captivity. He takes what God designed as marriage and he perverts it. But really, it's just a cheap knockoff. He is anything but original. 
Even one day in the future, he is looking to take the concept of the Messiah and create his own Christ, which we'll know as the Antichrist. And it's kind of like when you go to a swap meet. You always have to be careful. At first, you're walking around and you're seeing some pretty good deals. You're seeing some designer things and discounted prices. And you look at that Gucci bag. That's a pretty good price. And, you, and then you look a little bit closer. It doesn't say Gucci. It says Gucci. <laughs> or then you look to the watches and you're like, man, that's a nice watch. The weight's pretty good to it. Oh, Rolex. Wow, at this discounted cost. And then you look a little bit closer and it says, it doesn't say Rolex. It says Rolax. <laughs> you see, this wisdom, it's just a cheap knockoff. It's a counterfeit wisdom. And it's the exact wisdom that Satan uses to blind the minds of unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. How does the God of this age, which is a reference to saying, how does he blind people from believing? It's this wisdom that he uses. Some see a connection with this threefold description of false wisdom with man's great enemies. The Bible describes for us that there are three main enemies that every man, every woman, every person has. The world, the flesh, and the devil. This wisdom seems to be the sum total of all that works against mankind. That's the origin. Secondly, the characteristics. Verse 14. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not lie, do not boast and lie against the truth. We find the characteristics here in verse 14. What are the qualities of this wisdom? How do you, how do you know? You might know its origin, but how would you be able to see it? What would be what it's like. Well, James here starts out with a dangerous duo. He says, number one, that one of its characteristics is bitter envy. These are two distinct words that are coupled together uh, to create a point. Bitter was a word that James had actually just used in James 3.11. In James 3 verse 11, he talks about a bitter spring. That's the same word that he uses here it means harsh. It means kind of what you think, something bitter, sharp, and metaphorically used here, attached to the idea of envy. And envy is just a step above jealousy. It is a greedy and prideful longing for something that belongs to another. So when you put bitterness and envy together, what you have is to so long for something for yourself that it creates in you an attitude of resentfulness and hostility toward others. Bitter envy. Along with that is self-seeking. And self-seeking is exactly what it sounds like. To go after what you want regardless of what you have to do. There's an implication here, an undertone of rivalry. To stop at nothing to gain what you want. This is what this wisdom looks like. To have self-seeking is to do your own thing and do it in your own way. <laughs> Romans chapter 2 verse 8. Romans 2 8 talks about self-seeking. It says, but to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, in indignation, and wrath. Notice the connection there. Self-seeking leads to a disobedience to the truth and an obedience to unrighteousness. But if you look back there in verse 14, you'll notice that both of these characteristics, bitter envy and self-seeking, they have a starting point and it's in the heart. It's in the heart. This is always the starting point. Jesus taught us it is out of the abundance of one's heart the mouth speaks and then one's life is lived. Matthew 15, 19 says, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders. How does a heart murder somewhere, someone? Because that's where it starts. Adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. The heart of the problem is always the problem of the heart. 
And James indicates here that it's this kind of heart, this pride, uh, this, this kind of heart of self-seeking, it leads to pride. And this way of thinking gets us to actually lie against what we know is true. Notice there, notice in verse 14, James kind of warns. He says that this type of heart, he gives the command. He says, don't boast and lie against the truth. Why? Because what a life of self-seeking leads to is pride and self-deception. This word boast, it means to exalt yourself against. It actually means to rejoice over yourself, to take pride in. Does it sound familiar? It is to boast and lie against what is true. You see, as we look at our world, it becomes very evident that this is the wisdom that is clung to. This is the wisdom that's clung to because at the end of the day, truth is really of no concern to this type of wisdom. You could show the facts. You could show the stats. They say they're all about the science, right? But truth won't overcome their own self-seeking to the point where they are actually willingly self-deceived. Because for you and I who are in the light, we think this, this is not rational. Like Bible aside, let's just talk about facts and it don't make sense. And think about, I mean, I, I could go on and list the amount of things that don't make sense yet they're happening on a wide scale. This false wisdom would say something along this line. Seek first the kingdom of self, and all these things shall be added to you. This false wisdom would get up and preach and say, if you seek to find your life, you will find it. And if you seek to lose your life, you will lose it. This false wisdom would say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for self will last. The problem is, the results of this are absolutely disastrous. And you and I, when we look around our world, we are seeing the fruit. We are seeing the result of a crooked and perverse generation going after what they want and that causing even boasting in the things that should be their shame and lying against what they know is true. And the result we find in verse 16. Verse 16, for where envy and self-seeking exist, what do you find there? Confusion and every evil thing are there. Confusion. It's the first thing, first result. It's an upheaval. That's what the word means. It means a disturbance and disorder, chaos insurrection, instability. It is a disorder that comes from instability. And wherever there is this confusion, which we see everywhere, you can know that this false wisdom has been at work. Why? We know it's not the second wisdom because 1 Corinthians 14, says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. This wisdom is not from God. And so people look at their confused lives and they look at the evil in the world and they point their finger at God and he is, has a completely different wisdom. He has a completely different way of living that they have not been adhering to. This same word, interestingly enough, is found in Luke 21, this word confusion. Um, it's translated here, it's the same Greek word, but translated as that word commotions. Luke 21, nine, but when you hear of wars and commotions, confusion, chaos, do not be terrified for these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. You see, it is this confusion that will then set the stage for every evil thing. And that's the second one. And when it says every evil thing, the idea is that there will be no end to the evil that will come from embracing this type of wisdom. 
Meaning if God does not intervene one day and bring judgment, it'll only get darker and darker and more evil and more evil. And just when you think things can't get crazier, they will get more confusing and more immoral. Now we have the hope that God says it's not going to last forever. But rather it is right God's wrath that is filling up for the day of wrath You know, God saw this to be true, this reality, this truth of no end to evil. He saw it to be true in this foreknowledge and wisdom of the wise men of the world that got together to build a tower. It wasn't too many years earlier that God had to judge the entire world because of the great evilness in men's hearts and lives. And just a little while later, they get together and they begin to sin against God once again. Genesis 11, five and six says, but the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are the one, are one, and they have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. It, the, this thing that was gonna be, uh, this proposition, that now nothing that they propose isn't great things, but evil things. God saw that, that this collective group was gonna cause him to have to come and bring judgment again. And so actually in his grace does he confuse their language and separate them. He did something about it. And we can be assured that one day God will bring an end to the confusion and he will be, bring an end to every evil thing. And we should praise him for that and look forward to that. Now, before we move on to the wisdom from above, and we're gonna look at those similar things, we gotta know that this wisdom from below is our default way of living. This is not something that you have to teach someone. It is something that is inherited. Now, conversely, and very different from that, is the wisdom from above. Note down verses 17 and 18, the wisdom from above. And it is here that James is gonna employ a method of learning. And it is to compare and contrast. He went first with the negative. He laid the black background so he could put the diamond of God's wisdom that would shine brilliantly. And we've looked at what false wisdom, where it comes from. We've now looked at what it's like and also what it ultimately will result in. And now we're gonna see the opposite. So, the origin. We find this in verse 17, part A, the very first part. It says, but the wisdom that is from above. This is heavenly wisdom. And its origin is from God who is the giver of wisdom. He's the source. And God alone is above. No one else is in that category of above. And this wisdom is his. Proverbs 2.6 says, For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He is the source. It's all him. And this wisdom that he possesses and gives is not shared by any other. Though he desires to give wisdom... There's no one else that can. The scriptures tell us that God alone is wise. Note down these couple of scriptures. 1 Timothy 1.17, alongside with Jude 25, gives the very similar phrase from two different authors. Both Paul and Jude recognized this wisdom from God. 1 Timothy 1.17 says, Now to the king eternal immortal, invisible to God who alone, note that down, alone is wise. Be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. And in Jude 25, to God our Savior who alone is wise. Be glory and majesty, dominion, power, both now and forever, amen. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1, that it was Jesus who became this very wisdom of God. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 says, but of him you are in Christ Jesus 
who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. You see, Jesus is the very epitome of wisdom. He does not just possess it, but it is a part of his very nature. That's the origin. The characteristics we find in the second part of verse 17, that this wisdom is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Seven unique characteristics. Now, you'll notice some similarities as we go through this between the characteristics of wisdom and the characteristics of love that are found in 1 Corinthians 13. It would be an interesting uh, uh, thing to study alongside. Now, all seven of these, we must understand, are perfectly displayed in the earthly life of Jesus. So if, you wanna, if you're going through these, like, what, is, what does that one look like in action? Go to the Gospels. Look at Jesus. We are to look to him. Now, with this seven... Many scholars see a skillful and even artistic arrangement of this list in the original language. In Greek, James uses words that sound the same uh, and that create a sort of alliteration that is lost in the English. Apparently, when reading in Greek, there's actually a clear rhythm to it. Now, all that to say is that these were not random, nice words put here, but they were handpicked by the Spirit of God to describe the qualities of godly wisdom. So, number one, it's pure. And not only pure, it is first pure. This word, it means faultless, innocent. It's the idea of holiness. Pure was intentionally put first. Notice there in verse 17, notice the particular order and progression here. He says, first pure, then peaceable. There is a certain flow to this that is intentional. And I believe that to be because purity is not just one characteristic on the list, but is the key to them all. A.R. Fawcett, Bible commentator, he said this, He said, purity or sanctity is put first because it has respect both to God and to ourselves. The six that follow regard our fellow men. Our first concern is to have in ourselves sanctity or purity. Our second is to be at peace with men. See, wisdom will never walk without its proper partner of purity. When Jesus spoke of what the people thought about him in Matthew 11, he said these powerful words. He, he, is, he is repeating back what people have said about him. Matthew eleven nineteen. 19, notice this. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom, Jesus says, is justified by her children. They accuse Jesus of being impure, of being a sinner. Yet his life didn't show the fruit of what they said. And so Jesus responds with this great line, wisdom is justified by her children. The children of this heavenly wisdom is first pure. Wisdom's children are pure. This is the first and surest sign of wisdom. All right, does that make sense? Okay, number two, peaceable. Notice then, and I'm telling you, there's a progression here. Then peaceable. This means freedom from worry. It describes a a state of wholeness. Uh, This is not only talking about uh, peace internally, uh, but I think even more than that, kind of like what Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember when he said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. In Jesus' book, Peacemaking or being peaceable is part of the identifying mark of a true child of God. Romans 12, 18 says this, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. This is true wisdom. And we know that it's not always possible on the other person's side. 
But as much as depends on us, we are to pursue peace. Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue peace with all people. Like, you can't really misinterpret that. And holiness. And so there we have that connection with purity. Without which no one will see the Lord. I, I think these two are, are, are very important to be first. Pursuing peace and purity. True wisdom has these two aspects. And through them, through their pursuit, I believe not only we will see the Lord, but others will see him through us. Thirdly, gentle. Third, gentle it means to be considerate, patient. It's very similar to that attitude of meekness that we originally spoke about. I love this. Someone once described Abraham Lincoln as a man of velvet steel. I like that. Soft, but strong. Gentleness. Philippians 4, 5 says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. True wisdom doesn't need to be aggressive. Fourth, willing to yield. Now this is the one that kind of in my studying was, was kind of uh, interesting to me. Willing to yield. I didn't, write, didn't quite understand it at first. This, this phrase, it means reasonable. It means ready to obey. The quality here is to be open to what is reasonable. It's to be compliant without compromise. Willing to listen. It's not to be so stubborn and harsh like that of worldly wisdom. Matthew Henry shed, sheds a lot of light on this concept when talking about what it means to be willing to yield because we don't think of wisdom in that way. Heavenly wisdom, he says, is easy to be entreated. He says it's very persuadable, and catch this, either to what is good or from what is evil. There's an easiness that is weak and faulty, but it is not a blamable easiness to yield ourselves to the persuasions of God's word. And to all just and reasonable counsels or requests of our fellow creatures, no, nor to give up a dispute. Doesn't mean you can't, you can't get, doesn't mean you have to lay, uh, roll over. Where there appears a good reason for it and where a good end may be answered by it. Being willing to yield, it doesn't mean that you're a pushover or you're like a doormat. But it means that you are yielded to what is good and from what is evil. Fifth, full of mercy and good fruits. These, I believe, go together. Uh, these go together, full of mercy and good fruits. I, I think we, we can tell that because of that word and. The whole statement really expresses one idea. Because when you are full of mercy, then a life of good fruit is to follow. To be full of mercy is to be constantly controlled by compassion. Biblical mercy is compassion in action, looking to gain nothing in return. I think a really good example of this is in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Are you familiar with it? Think about that story for a moment. Worldly wisdom passes by on the other side because it's full of self-seeking. But the wisdom of God, which is full of mercy and good fruits, it stops it cares, it moves, and it's willing to pay whatever cost is necessary. This is wisdom. And the last two are in a negative sense. He says, without partiality. Number six, without partiality. This word is, it means non-divisive. It means that you are not partial to someone because of race or class or, or anything else. This word is unique. You don't find this Greek word in any other place in the New Testament, but I think it's pretty closely associated with what James already discussed back in James chapter two. If you open up to James two, you don't have to right now, but if you were, you will find James addressing the sin of playing favorites. He talks about a partiality. He said to, to treat someone different based upon, based upon may, maybe their class, uh, of, of wealth or something along those lines. And he says it's sin because God is not a God of partiality, right? That's kind of similar here. 
And then seventh, without hypocrisy. This is, of course, to be sincere and genuine. Wisdom is not hypocritical, meaning it doesn't act one way around some people and then another around others. Now, if you're like me, when I come to a list like this in the Bible, uh, there can be a moment of discouragement where you look at that list and you're like, wow, I am not very wise. Or you look at a list of the fruit of the spirit and you're like, I am not very spiritual. Or you look at that list in 1 Corinthians 13 of love and you're like, I am the most unloving person I know. I don't think those lists that God gives in the scriptures are meant to discourage us. I think they're meant for us to see that we can't do it on our own. But I also don't think they're meant in a way where, where we try to be those things. Where we look at the fruit of the spirit and we think, I'm just going to be more loving. And God's like, it is a fruit. You cannot manufacture it. Or, or here, this is not, we need to really try to be gentle. It's not going to last. We'll address it in a moment as, as we come to a close and, and, and shortly but I think that these characteristics in your life, they don't come from a result of trying to be them, but having received this wisdom from God himself. And we'll look at that more in a moment. But this, let's close this, uh, this out in verse 18, the result. The result. The result says, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. And there's a really good comparison here because remember, the results of that fake wisdom is what? Confusion and evil, every evil thing. Conversely, we see the result of true wisdom is peace and righteousness. Righteousness is the result. Righteousness always follows true wisdom. It is out of a life of true wisdom that right living before God and then peace can exist. Where there is righteousness, there's peace. Where there's unrighteousness, there's chaos. Righteousness and peace always go together. Isaiah 32, 17 says, the work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Remember, God is not the author of confusion, but what is he the author, author of? Peace. He's all about it. He wants it for your life. He desires you to have the peace of God that surpasses understanding. Listen, God desires world peace, but not like the way that the world wants it. And one day, Jesus will bring world peace, and he will usher that peace in through his righteousness. But we must not be deceived. Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says, Do not be deceived. God's not mocked. For whatever man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to the, his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. You see, when one sows to self-seeking, they're going to reap confusion. When they sow to bitter envy, they are going to reap every evil thing. But when one sows, plants in his life the pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, and so on, wisdom of God, the inevitable reality is a harvest of righteousness and peace. It's these two things that one day Jesus will ultimately bring to bear. And he will do that by first establishing righteousness and that will cause there to be peace. We look forward to that day. But until then, what do we do now? What is the proper response to a study like this? How do we make sure that we are living according to the right wisdom? Because remember, James is practical. This, this isn't just something that he wants us to know, but something that he wants us to now live by. Do we take a class or enroll in an online course in wisdom? Well, not quite. The first step is something that you might not think. The first step is actually to become a fool. The deception that this world brings 
is that someone could be wise outside of the submission of Jesus Christ. Think about it. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So what's the starting point? The starting point is to realize that you don't know nothing and that you are willing to become a fool in this world because the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world are contrary to one another. And God looks at the wisdom of the world as foolishness and the wisdom of the world looks at the wisdom of God as foolishness. First Corinthians three, verse 18 through 20 says, let no one deceive himself. Now listen, whenever the Bible says, let no one deceive himself or do not be deceived, that means that this is an area that many people are deceived by, okay? If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, who is wise and understanding among you, right? Let him become a fool that he might become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in his own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. You must become a fool in this world to receive the wisdom of God. You cannot proceed further until you count yourself a fool for Jesus. The world looks at the cross of Christ as foolishness. And it is that same cross that you and I must cling to. The Bible tells us that it pleased God through the foolishness of the message, that's the gospel, preached to save those who believe. And that message is Christ crucified. That message is that Jesus came, that he died, and that he rose again. And to become a fool for Jesus is to admit that you need him. And it will become the wisest decision you ever make. And so my challenge to you today, maybe you've found yourself in this place, maybe a friend invited you, maybe you're watching online. If you're an unbeliever, meaning you look at the gospel, you look at what Jesus did as something that you've not received, my challenge is that you would become a fool and cling to Christ. Admit your sinful foolishness and that you need him And it is the God of all wisdom that will save you. The Bible says that we are to call on the name of Jesus who alone is wise and we shall be saved. Now, you can clap, it's good. Now for all of us who have already become fools for Jesus, this wisdom is actually already something available to us. The Bible says all you have to do is ask. James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. Step one, become a fool. Step two, every day realize you're still a fool and you need Jesus. (laughs) And you come to him doesn't matter if you've been walking with Jesus for five minutes or 50 years, come to God. He is desiring to give his wisdom. He's not this infinite wise God who sits in his throne in heaven and, and looks down at us with judgment and critique. But he says, come. He says, I have an infinite flow. My wisdom is past finding out and I have it for you. Notice those two words there in James 1 5, gives to all liberally and without reproach. Now you might look at liberal and be scared, but don't be. Okay, liberally is generously and without reserve. That's what that means. He's ready to give. No strings attached. There's no catch. There's no hidden fees or taxes. He says, come and ask, and you have. Without reproach, no criticism. You come and and there's no mocking or guilt involved. The only condition that God has for those who ask is that they actually believe that he not only has wisdom, but that he's willing to give it. Right after this verse, he says, let him ask in faith without doubting. And he who asks with doubting, don't act like you're gonna receive anything. But you come to God with your situation. What is it today? What do you need God's wisdom for? If you admit that you don't know what to do and you come to God and you come genuinely 
and you come believing, then I believe that each and every one of us will have the wisdom that we need because God's wisdom is not lacking. The problem is typically we're not asking. Sure, we think a lot, we worry a lot, but how often are we really praying? We often convert that. Oh, I was thinking a lot about it. So, what are you doing? Ask for wisdom. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. I'm so glad that God doesn't have moods. He has emotions, but he doesn't have moods. And when we come to him, day in and day out, God says, I have wisdom for you. I will show you what to do, when to do it, how to do it. I have given you the spirit of wisdom, the wisdom of the, of the word, and I am, I'm, I'm with you. All we have to do is come. A.W. Tozer, will close with this quote, in the knowledge of the holy, wrote these words about God's wisdom in our lives. He says, to believe actively that our heavenly father constantly spreads around us providential circumstances that work for our present good and our everlasting well-being brings to the soul a veritable benediction. Most of us go through life praying a little, planning a little, jockeying for position, hoping but never quite being certain of anything and always secretly afraid that we will miss the way. This is a tragic waste of truth and never gives rest to the heart. There is a better way. It is to uh, repudiate our own wisdom and take instead the infinite wisdom of God. God has charged himself with full responsibility for our eternal happiness and stands ready to take over the management of our lives the moment we turn in faith to him. (laughs) We would be wise if we would turn the management of our lives over to him. And so I think after this passage, the call is clear you think that you're wise in here today, let you become a fool. Cling to the cross. And if like me, you've known you're a fool for a while now, (laughs) and you need wisdom, which you do and I do every day, every moment, would we rely on the all-powerful, infinite wisdom of God? Because God not only knows all things, but he's willing with that very knowledge to guide your life. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, for what you've spoken to us this afternoon. We thank you that you are not a God of confusion, but a God of clarity. And God, you so clearly laid out in this passage the difference. And we look at our world and we see it. We see a confused society. And we can trace it back to this wisdom. And God, we pray for those who might be in this room or watching today, and they've been relying on themselves. They have been seeking themselves, seeking to find their life. And what they don't know is that that very pursuit, they will lose it all. God, would you draw them to yourself as we know you're faithful to do? Would they let go and consider themselves a fool that they might receive the wisdom of God, which is Jesus Christ, the Lord. And Lord, for us who need your wisdom, every day. Lord, we just, in a genuine way, in a way believing without doubt, we ask for your wisdom, for the things that are at hand, for how to handle a marriage difficulty, how to handle a wayward child, how how to deal with those people
people at work, how to, so many. And we're so thankful that you haven't left us to ourselves. And you're there every day, every morning, ready to give liberally and without reproach. May you cause in us a reliance and dependence on you that has not been there before. We thank you that we don't have to worry about our lives because they are in your hands and no one's gonna snatch us out. And that the wisdom of God is greater than the foolishness of man. And so we love you, God, and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.